Thanks for coming for really the last talk. I didn't expect to see that many people interested in what I've learned as a manager. Uh, first of all, I want to lower your expectations. Remember those green, yellow, red things on the voting over there? I would like to lower your expectations because uh, who's there, senior engineer and, or team lead and hire? Show of hands. You can leave. No, really, because the things I'm gonna talk about are, now are really obvious to me as a, as a team leader, as a senior engineer, they are really obvious. However, even though they are and might sound obvious to you, what I would like you to do after you leave the room is think about it, what I've just, what I'm about to talk about. is basically try to reflect on those things understand whether you are, um, whether you know that you have those skills and if you apply them consciously or maybe unconsciously, so, so just go and try to self, do the self-introspection, do the self-reflection on the topics I'm gonna cover. All right, so let's get started and I'm gonna start with a little story. Uh, it happened almost six years ago on February 14th, 2014, the St. Valentine's Day, me and my wife got married. Um, thank you for some, <laughs> no, that's not the topic of the talk. Anyway, <laughs> uh, and it usually happens uh, when people got married, they go to the honeymoon trip, and we decided to go to the country called New Zealand. Any New Zealanders Kiwis around there? Awesome, thank you for having such a lovely country. That's a beautiful country, it, it's, it has great nature, has great people, has great food, like everything is great except that it is far away. I used to live in Moscow back then, and to get there, it took me like 30 hours to cover for the 16,000 kilometers, which is around 10,000 miles. And to justify this kind of a ride, we had to go for the longer vacation. We took three weeks uh, to go through the entire country. You can see the route over there. We had like almost three and a half thousand kilometers road by car, and we had stayed in 15 hotels. So in 21 days, 15 hotels. Pretty. Um, intense, right? So we had to unpack, pack and unpack all those things almost every day. And, well, hopefully we booked all our accommodation, like uh, hotels, bed and breakfast, all different lodges and everything. We booked everything on Booking.com. No, that's not a commercial, that's not an advertisement of Booking.com, even though I work there. However, the story is really related on why I'm standing here on stage. Because after we came back from this vacation, I got really excited because our trip was not ruined because of the hotel or host or any other property. We haven't been asked to relocate somewhere else. All the pictures matched exactly what were on the website. They matched exactly what was on the property. So I got excited not about the trip itself, but also the smoothness of the trip because of the product they, uh, Booking.com was doing. And I thought for myself like, hey, they're doing great product. I would really like to join them, to work for them. So that, that's where I went, careers website for booking.com, and I applied for the, for the software developer there, and they got me hired, and that's where my story ends. Why I was talking about that? Because it really defined my life into the next five years, and it really defined why I'm standing here on stage in front of you right now. But most importantly, and this is related to the talk now, the, the moment I submitted my CV to the careers website, I uh, showed the first skill of the manager or of the, of the person, um, which is called productivity, uh, proactivity. So proactivity, let's put it that way, like when you are reactive, that means that something happens and you respond to that. Being proactive means that you are doing something ahead of time, that you foresee something which may happen, and you first act before that happens. So what do I mean right now? So imagine um, you work on a scrum. You have sprints, and your sprint ends on Friday. And today is Wednesday. And let's say you've completed your sprint. You have no items in the backlog, and you're a developer. So what can you do? You can just do nothing. You can watch YouTube, you can watch conference videos, you can read, you can go for a walk, you can read, drink coffee, and that's okay. I don't blame you for that because you were given a task or a set of tasks and you accomplished all of them. That's the contract between your manager and yourself and you've accomplished it successfully. Me as a manager, now if we 
look at this as a management uh, people. I'm upset, but again, I cannot blame you because that's how things work. However, what I would like you to do, and I would love this person if they approach me and say, hey, you know, by the way, I've, I've done everything on, uh, on the backlog, but I have other things to do. For example, I have this idea. I have this new feature in mind. Can I start working on that? I would literally love this person at the moment because not only they help me to avoid this emptiness in their backlog, but also they try to move forward the product. They try to bring some added value to that. And of course, next time where there will be decision between promoting the person one or person B, I would of course prefer to promote the person who tried to help me, who was proactive in bringing things to the table, to, to the product. So what to do if you don't know what, what are those features, if you, don't, if you can't come up with the feature to work on yourself? Easiest thing to do is just come to your manager and ask, how can I help you? If you ask them, hey, I have free time, what's on your plate? What can I take to help you sort it out? Me as a manager, I would be really grateful for this conversation because that means that my life becomes easier and life of the manager is always hard. If, if the manager is, is not 100% Occupied, they are doing something wrong, or really, maybe something great, but well, usually that not happens. Anyway, if you ask them often, how can I help you? That means that you are trying to help them and you are learning some new things on your own and you are making people around you better. So imagine we have a feature, you have a feature proposed, but it's not the only requirement you need to have. You need also to have some sort of commercial awareness. You need to understand why this feature should be done. You know what that place on the picture? That's, uh, that's Hobbiton, that's the, from the movie Lord of the Rings, which was, film set, uh, which was filmed on, in New Zealand. So the whole movie set uh, was built on the, on the land of a, of, of a person, right? There was a guy who owned the land and they built it. Why well, I'm showing this picture in relation to commercial awareness because that person did not take much money from the filmmakers when they built that. So the, he didn't take much money to the right for, for me, filmmakers to build the uh, set. Instead, he kept all those things, all those artifacts after the movie finished, the movie film, filming finished, and now it's a huge attraction place for tourists coming to visit New Zealand. So this guy makes a huge amount of money just because he was thinking commercially and strategically. He didn't rush up for the immediate revenue, rather for the strategic, strategic view and how this is gonna bring him more revenue, more money. So um, I wanna ask you, uh, so how, who is here an uh, individual contributor writing code? All right, a few people. So can you please remember a topic or a feature you've already shipped to production, like some recent feature you've already shipped to production, and how many of you can now tell me, uh, do you know what this feature had, on, uh, which impact this feature had on your business, like relation to metric like sales or whatever metric? How many people can tell me what's the impact of this feature? Much, much less, right? And how many of you knew what the impact would be before you take on this feature, uh, feature at, um, from the backlog? Not much. That's what I'm talking about. Basically, um, we usually, and, and I usually hear from developers, hey, I'm hired here to write code. I'm not here for business. And that's okay. Yes, you were hired to write code. And to make business, there are product managers, there are chief product officers, whatever. However, if we talk about becoming better developers, becoming higher up on the career ladder, you need to think about business. You need to bring on those commercial things as your skill set. Um, I'm gonna tell you a story. So when I joined Booking, like two or three months after that, I was working in the team which was responsible for the web page of the hotel website, of the ho hotel page of the website for tablets. Doesn't matter, hotel page. So we were responsible for making this page look better, even though it was already a well done product. So after a while, I noticed that uh, there are rooms in the rooms table which are sorted by price. 
However, in the gallery, in the photo gallery on the huddle page, pictures were just randomized. So I thought, um, what if we sort out the pictures in the gallery in the same way as rooms are sorted? Because people are tend to buy cheaper rooms. So the hypothesis was like, okay, you scroll through the uh, picture gallery, you find the first room there, it's cheaper than others, you click book straight from the gallery and you are done. You're like, you're our customer now. So I discussed this uh, hypothesis with my product manager and she said, yeah, it might be a good idea. The data shows that it may be, may be working, so let's run the experiment. So I set up a feature, I ran the experiment, and after two weeks when I need to make, needed to make a decision whether to put this experiment full on or not, I noticed that, first of all, yes, uh, conversion increased, so people started to book more. However, the commission from those bookings was higher than my entire yearly gross salary in two weeks. So I already brought more money than I would have cost my company to hire me, to bring me there, to Amsterdam from Moscow, and for the full year I had in two weeks. That was super impressive, and to me, like just two, three months in the company, that was like, oh my God, I can do such things here just because I think about what can be better for the customer next. And I've implemented any, uh, more other features, successful, not successful, but I was always uh, kind of thinking about the customer and thinking more about what can we do else. In the end, it resulted in the, some bonus to me, which so basically I got some money back from the company. All right, so but what if you don't know how, like, about business, what do you do? Just talk to your product manager. These are people who work hard to make product better. They understand about metrics, they understand about any other business related topics. So just talk to them and ask, every time you pick up the issue from the backlog, just ask them, hey, why am I working on that? What's the benefit this feature will bring to the customer? What's the, feature, what's the benefit this feature will bring to our business, to our company? Try to understand data, try to gather more data, try to come up with new ideas, and validate your hypothesis with product managers. So right, moving on. Uh, we have a feature. This feature is good from the commercial point of view. So what do we do next? Next comes responsibility. Um, what do you think if I say somebody is responsible? That means usually that the person is really, uh, well, generally this person is good, we can rely on them, so whatever task you assign, they will finish and everything will be, everybody will be happy. But there is a slight difference between responsible and responsible for. Those three letters make a difference. Because if I am responsible for my dog, I can be a really shitty person. I can be late on stand-ups. I, I can maybe commit bugs to the repository. I'm not responsible. You cannot call me responsible. But I am responsible for my dog. I know that he is fed, fed well. He was walked in the morning, and he's happy in general. Or, like people from New Zealand, those few hands over there, they are responsible for kiwis. Kiwi are uh, tiny little birds, like a bit bigger than this tattoo. Anyway, they are, are almost all extinct. There are around 300, 400 species in the whole planet. They all live in New Zealand, and people from New Zealand are responsible to make sure that those little creatures can live longer, can survive, and can you know, um, become a stable species again. So that's what I want you to bring on, being responsible for the things you're proposing. So if you have a feature in mind, make sure that you are, um, this feature will, brought, will be brought to the end. Maybe not entirely by you, by other people, or if you cannot handle this, find another person who you can delegate this feature to, or as a result, it could be, no, we're not going to make this feature, shut it down. That's also a result. So being responsible for something means that you can take it from the start to the very end. Again, I can tell you my story about that. Um, again, in the beginning of my work at Booking.com, I was asked to help uh, one team with, to, to do some backend work for them. Because they didn't have any backend developers, they actually, in fact, had only one designer actually half designer and half product manager to work on a specific product, and they asked me to help with some backend. When I was doing this feature, 
I realized that the same code was written three different times by three different people in three different places. So what I could do, I could either do nothing, write the fourth implementation of the same thing and go away because it's not my team, I don't care. Or I could flag this issue and say, hey, by the way, this team requires dedicated developer, maybe not full time, but at least the person, go to person who will take care of that um, duplicate and duplicate of code, right? A few weeks passed and I was approached by the senior manager asking, hey, would you like to become that developer? No, but well, there's a senior manager asking me to get guy in the company for four months. I couldn't say really no, even though I was really hesitant. In the end, I said yes. That sounds like an opportunity, even though it's maybe not really like not that nice to work on the product, which like was only managed by two halves of the people. But in the end, that resulted into the full, fully operational team being formed. Me as a backend developer, frontend developer, designer, copywriter, team leader, and product manager. So we got a full team after that. To make, we made this product evolve. And eventually, after a few months, my team leader left to the other team, and I became a TL in that team. So I got promotion because of my first being proactive and responsible for the things I'm doing in the company, and I carried those skills over time, and that granted me the new role as a team lead. So I think now is the time to introduce myself. Yes, middle of the talk, really right about time. Um, I joined Booking.com in, uh, in September 2014 as a backend developer. Half a year later, a few months, more than half a year, uh, in June 2015, I became a team leader. Then I went back to individual contributor because we were experimenting with autonomous teams where we were removing team leaders from teams and forming the teams which are mutually responsible for, for the whole uh, team uh, health. So I moved to one of those teams out of curiosity, so I, so I basically stepped back to become a developer. And that's the moment where I start realizing that, hey, soft skills matter. Because when you're a developer, you you the code mostly. You don't care about all those responsibilities and stuff, or you, you may do those things, you may be responsible, you may be proactive, you may know commercial uh, side of things, but you are not really conscious about this. And when you become team leader, you're again not really conscious about those things. You start using those skills more often because that's what you do. You work with people, you work with product, you have to be responsible and have to be uh, really proactive on things. But again, you are not really conscious about that. It's your natural way of working. However, when you step back again to become a developer, now, at least for me, that's where the change happened. I started to think, oh my God, those are things, responsibility, commercial awareness, productivity. I could do this more consciously while being a developer, and I can apply those skills while writing code and do things better than that. I can run communities, of developers within the organization. I can do presentations, I can write documentation. I can do more because I now understand that this is all possible, this is all applicable to development as well. So in a few months from that, I became a senior developer. Again, like being promoted to senior in half a year at Booking is something which is not really common. I'm not bragging, I don't like to brag, I'm really a modest person there. It's just a, like visualization of how consciously applying soft skills can help in your career and your as person as a as a as a employer, employee. And then I became a TL again, and then I switched to individual contributor again. Now I'm a lead developer. Like you know, I'm going up and down and trying to find what's what's my best way of working. And uh, that's why I love booking. I can do these things without being blamed, and I can do this free. Uh, free. Anyway, that's not the point. Let's move on forward. So you have your feature. You have your feature really validated and it's commercially successful, the problem might be that you cannot carry on this yourself, not necessarily. You have to bring in on more people on board. You have to maybe, if you want to have some front-end changes, you need developer, front-end developer, or maybe app developer. So what you really need to do is talk to them. Your next skill, and it's one of the most important skills ever, is communication. Because whenever you bring up new idea to the people around you, 
they will probably look like this. They will say, what, what, do you, what, what are we talking about? Why are we even talking about? That's extra work for me to do. I don't want it. What's in it for me? And you need to explain them why this is important. Of course, you understand that. It's your feature. It's your baby. You know how valuable it is, but they don't know. And that's your key, your, your key responsibility to basically explain why this is happening. But it's not only important to communicate well. You have to know how to communicate with different people. All those people look similar. However, they are not. They are different personalities. So <clears throat> imagine a situation. You have a developer and you have a product manager. And you need to bring them an idea. Let's say move into Kubernetes. Kubernetes is great, right? Everybody loves Kubernetes. Everybody likes cloud-first approach. So you would like to talk to your developer, fellow developer, and the product manager about this idea. I think that's going to be obvious if I say that you need to talk to developer differently from how do you talk to product manager. Because developers uh, talk about technology, like latency, uh, easy CI, CD, all those stuff. And product managers care about time to market, business value, et cetera. Anyone thinks different? Anyone thinks that we can talk the same way to product manager and developer? OK, nice. Good, thank you. Uh, but now let's say that we have another product manager moving into your team, and you have to explain them the value of the Kubernetes thing. How many of you think that we can use the same pitch, the same, uh, the same arguments to, to the other product manager? Anyone? Really nice, cool. Almost none. Exactly, because they are, even though they share the same role, they are different people. Um, you know, different scientists like to classify people on buckets, and there is yet another model to classify people on buckets. I don't know the name of the model, um, but I really relate to it. I, I really like it because it kind of, kind of matches my personality and other people's personalities, what, what I've noticed. Uh, there are analytical, driver, amiable, and expressive people around. And communication to them is different. For example, if you have a product manager driver, that means that they really like to be uh, detailed, direct, to the point, like boom, 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 Kubernetes will bring you this, 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 and this in three months. Awesome. For, for driver, that's awesome because you are clear, you're to the point, you don't waste time on going around the bush. As opposite, if you go with the same pitch to your amiable product manager, they will just say, wait a minute, I don't know what you're talking about. Please, let's, let's take a break. Let's discuss it later. Because they were confronted with the communication style which they are not used to. Amiable people would like to first establish personal connection. Like, how do you feel? How's your family? Everything going good? What did, what did you have for lunch? And then you start, hey, by the way, there is a Kubernetes thing. It can bring you this value. It can bring you this uh, time to market. Yes, you still have to uh, use the same argument, like business arguments, but in a different communication way. More relaxed, more interpersonal, uh, more welcoming. So knowing that, at least that moment, model or any other model, knowing that people are different, helps you to bring your idea to the it's to its end and to make sure you have people on board. So that's all great, but how do you know that you are doing the right job? And that's where feedback comes in. Usually, feedback, well, not usually, but sometimes feedback can be perceived as something negative because I'm telling you that you did something wrong. And when I deal with people who are defensive to feedback, those people who don't like feedback, don't accept feedback, and always tell me, hey, no, it's, it's a, that's wrong. I didn't do this. You, 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 you got it wrong. I feel like I'm just you know, talking to the wall. I really, as a manager, I spend so much resources and energy to talk to people who are defensive and trying to make them understand that I am there for their good. I want them to, to learn. I want them to become better. In fact, in respond, I get, no, 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 that, that's bullshit. No, 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 that, that never happened. I will try more, 
but in the end I will even unconsciously maybe be biased against those people because I don't have this connection. I don't think that they're going to learn from their mistakes. And if a person doesn't learn from feedback for quite a long time, well, that's not going to work for the long term. So feedback is a good thing in general. So learn how to look for feedback from your colleagues, especially when you're doing not coding. Because when you code, you just write, you ship it to the production, it works, it doesn't fail. That's your feedback. Everything is OK for you as a developer. However, if you start going outside of the tech and go into uh, coordinating other people, working towards bringing feature to production, being more like on the soft skill side of things, then you don't get immediate feedback of whether you are doing this right. So look for this feedback. Ask people around you, how did you do? What can you improve? And try to get this feedback right. Try to soak it in and then see where can you grow. But importantly, again, we're talking about management side of things here, right? So for me as a manager, that's important to understand whether I am doing right or not. So please, you as my employees, as my developers, come to me and tell me the feedback of whether I'm doing good or not. Because sometimes I can implement the process change, which will bring some results in a year from now. During this year, I will be daily thinking whether I did right or wrong. And it's really pressure for me to, to not knowing the results, to not knowing whether it is what I'm doing is, worth, is worthy. Maybe I'm not just the right person. Maybe, it's, it, maybe I'm in the wrong place. Maybe I shouldn't be a team lead. I don't know. That's all those things come up without feedback. So please give feedback often to your managers. And to do that, you want to, to have feedback in a constructive way. And for that, there are, some again, some models. For example, I really like the BIO model. BIO stands for Behavior, Impact, and Option. First of all, you need to describe what the behavior was and what was the situation, like the context of this behavior. Then you just talk about impact, and then you present some options, how can you improve. To, as an example, I would like to show you two feedbacks. I think that yesterday your interaction with Marie was not correct. Your communication style doesn't fit our company. Please think on how we can improve that. Anyone here can tell me what was the situation and what, what I am talking to, uh, about? Anyone? No? Wild guesses? Cool. Because this is not constructive. Because, yes, that's happened, maybe it happened recently, maybe yesterday, maybe last week, but I have no idea what are you talking about. Yes, interaction with Marie, but what exactly? What did I talk, what did I tell her? I actually don't even remember that I was talking to Maria. So I will probably ignore this feedback and move on. And later I will get a peep because I'm not responsive to feedback. See? And now let's move on to biofeedback. Yesterday, while talking to Maria, you loudly, you was loudly blaming someone else's code. This was heard by Jonathan who wrote that code. Now he feels insecure and has to recheck every commit three times. That slows down productivity of the team. In our company, we try not to blame people, especially on public. Could you please, next time, uh, share your concerns one-on-one -on -one with him? What do you think? Who now gets the idea of what happened? Like, you see, almost everybody. So there's clear behavior, loudly blaming someone else's code. That's the behavior. That's what happened. And you probably remember this because, well, that's, that's something huge. And then you know, uh, show about the impact. Jonathan, who is generally a good developer, he was like in the company for a long time. He's doing really great. Yes, he made a mistake, and you brought it, up, brought it up. So now he feels insecure. Now he slows down the whole team. That's impact not only on the person, but on the company. So that's huge. And then I provide you some options. For example, you can talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. But more importantly, I left, leave some space for other options. What do you think here? So if you present feedback in that way, it's easy. It has nothing different from the feedback I showed earlier, like this. But this is toxic, like that lake. And this is not. So if you learn yourself how to do proper feedback, and if you spread the word about this 
kind of feedback technique. It's one of, one of many. There are others, like Coin, Bio, many others. But what's more important is like you have to put the person in the context first and then emphasize what, what this behavior brought to and then provide some options and discuss. Doing this feedback and this style will help you uh, uh, bring, this, uh, bring this feedback more to the person. So let, let's actually wrap up. That's all those six things. If you, if you were counting, that was the last sixth one. So we talked about proactivity. Don't wait until something happens. Act. See, seek for opportunities within the company. There are always few ways or few things you can improve. So work on that and then try to understand why those things you are going to do matter for the company. What can you improve from the business point of view? What can you improve from the customer point of view? What can you improve from maybe uh, internal point of view? Like if you build a community for developers, it's also uh, value, valuable. Maybe not commercially valuable, but it's valuable for uh, employees' health and uh, how they perceive the company. So they will stay there for longer. Responsibility, take responsibility for what you are doing and bring those features you are trying to, uh, to implement from the start to the very end. Communicate to people and know how to communicate differently to people and ask for feedback. That's it. Questions, suggestions? Right on. Do we have any questions? It's that time of the day, but uh, everybody's still here, so maybe there's something. Um, do you enjoy the switching around between individual contributor and team, team lead? Yes, in short. Um, what I really enjoyed is that the part in, uh, connects to the feedback, basically. When you're a team leader, you don't get instant feedback. You always have to wait until that hits you back sometime. When you switch to the uh, individual contributor, the code you write, you run, in, run it in, like, in an hour or so in production, boom, instant feedback, instant like, yeah, gratification. So that part I liked. I also liked the part that, well, I can do things on my own, like, on my own. But at the same time, I've never left the idea of leading people. Like, as you notice now, I'm lead developer. It means that I'm not only writing code, but also kind of technical, provide technical leadership. So I'm not, I don't have direct reports, but still I do work with people. I still couch them, mentor them, and, and so on and so forth. So for me, people's side is always important, at least for me. But it doesn't have to be management side. It can be different. The, the question is, do you see yourself doing that for the rest of your career? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't see why not. As I said, I enjoy working with people, so it doesn't matter if I technically lead them or manage them or like a leader, lead from the personal side of things. So for me, yes, I, I don't mind switching back. Cool. Any other questions? Yeah, one more. Um, since you are obviously have this leadership potential, right? You are able to switch back and forth. But uh, what do you think about the idea for you to stay as a lead and then keep growing other people to be more like you versus you go back in their shoes and be an individual contributor? Like in the long term, do you think that it might be you know more valuable for the organization to be to stay for you to stay as a lead manager lead role and keep growing everybody else? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, it's a good one. I think that it doesn't matter what your title is. It, it, what matters is basically who you are personally. So you, I, when I switched back to IC, I still kept working with people. I provide mentorship, right, feedback them. So I just didn't have this management burden. So I didn't have direct reports to do this, the like, performance valuations and all those things. However, I didn't stop working with people, and that's what, like, that's what what me is basically. So, that's it's all about being a role model. You don't have to be, you don't have to have certain title to be a role model. You can be a manager, but nobody listens to you. You're just a manager, or you could be a leader without a title. So I prefer to be a leader without, like, with doesn't matter which title I do have, just. 
trying to work with people and lead them and show them examples. It, seem, it seems your positions uh, are aligned with what your company and your teams need. Yep. Um, any other questions, theories, answers, comments? It feels like a Friday. <laughs> I think there's going to be booze out there pretty soon, so enjoy yourself. There's one more keynote after this, so don't go home. Thank you very much, Georgi. Thank you.